Uh, thanks, Sean, and um, I'm delighted to be here. Um, again, I have a script. Um, Joe has it. I'll try and skip through it a little bit. But before we talk about the, I suppose, present dangers facing the Irish economy, I think we need to reflect a little bit about what has happened as all since 2008. And, you know, clearly a crisis hit us. Uh, clearly, simple solutions were never going to work. So, for example, the Irish Congress of Trade Unions never bought into the default solution. We actually went off and commissioned a study to see what had happened in uh, Argentina. And the one lesson is we don't want to be in Argentina because you even saw in the last couple of weeks uh, some of the vulture funds that hold some of the bonds that were defaulted uh, back in the early 2000s are still tying up the Australian or the Argentinian government and the Argentinian people in the consequences of that. So there were no simple solutions. But the difficulty we experienced from 2008 uh, up to the last couple of years is the absolute uniform single message that was given to us all, which was there was no alternatives to a single-minded uh, austerity debate. And there was no space given in the media or in academic life or uh, anywhere else uh, for a different uh, voice. Uh, uh, to the extent that the trade union movement had to come together uh, and a number of us created an economic research institute, the uh, Nevin Economic Research Institute, because that voice, which would be a mainstream voice in North America or in continental Europe, was given no space to exist and articulate a view uh, in, in Irish society. And like, that is definitely a weakness in the system. A lot of criticisms around how we got into the space, and interestingly, John says, like, they encourage people to ask the stupid question. There was a single-minded cheering of the boom, and then there was a single-minded, you know, there is only one course of austerity. Uh, and that is wrong, and that is a danger. And as we go into a different form of economy and society, we need to have a public debate uh, from different perspectives, where there are platforms where different views uh, can, 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 can exchange views and debate and eventually uh, inform public decisions. Uh, with regard to you know, what we've done since 2008, uh, the trade unions said we were going to have to get our deficit down below 3%. The only question was the timing. Interestingly, we were entirely alone when we said it couldn't be done in the original timescale. Government said it has to be done. Lo and behold, the Troika actually said can't be done. It needs another year. If the original plan was to be implemented, we would have a 3% deficit this year. It's now going to be next year. And even those 12 months mean an awful lot to the social fabric that uh, John was talking about, uh, the pressures uh, and all that goes with that. So the potential threats... Uh, that we see at the moment uh, has to start with a recurring nightmare and that's house prices and rents and the simple example is property porn has returned to the Irish Times there's a vested interest in property price inflation for our banks thereby reducing negative equity and housing rent increases in the Dublin area in parts are averaging 20 to 30 percent. In some parts of the city, the only workers who can afford to enter into new leases are those who work for multinational IT companies with limited connections with the domestic economy. Those who do work in the domestic economy can't afford to keep pace with these levels of increases. And inevitably, this will seep into wage bargaining as it did during the period 2002 to 2008. And there's an urgent need for government intervention in the housing market. Private tenants need to be given some form of security. Uh, we would suggest up to five-year leases uh, that would be operated by CPI every year. Um, the NESC has uh, recently produced uh, a well-informed, uh, ambitious program for social housing. Uh, but if you just think about it, uh, we see these terrible cases of people being evicted uh, in the media, uh, particularly people at pensioner level, uh, been uh, turfed out because they can't afford not to pay their rent, but to pay the massive increases in rent. And that's now seeping its way around the city of Dublin and probably some of the other areas. The other uh, potential threat that I see is the absence of a wage policy and any forum for it to be discussed. And that is a glaring threat to our economic well-being. The Irish cost of living remains 15% more than the Western European average. We have to pay for stuff that others don't, particularly education and health. By way of example, 
the new German minimum wage is 8.50 an hour. And that will buy a lot more in Germany than our 8.65. And the German worker has a lot more social supports. But we should also remember that the German worker probably pays a lot more in taxes and social security contributions than here. And despite the terrible mistakes made by the Troika and the government in their accelerated austerity, we are now seeing the first indications of recovery translating into the beginnings of pay movements in parts of the private sector. This is happening company by company. It's too early to consider any national agreement, but we will eventually need a national framework for productivity and wage movement in the environment of a single currency and global competition. There is residual opposition to any such engagement, anything that smacks a social partnership in parts of uh, the Fine Gael party, but I suspect that will be eventually overcome, hopefully not too late. And if there is very significant wage movement, it will not be possible for the government to intervene and ask that that be slowed down after the genie is out of the bottle. Uh, and that's an important point to make. I was interested as well in John's comment about uh, inequality. And obviously the book that's probably on a lot of shelves without having been completed is Piketty's uh, book, uh, Capital, who emphasizes uh, the absolute divergence of the worlds of those at the top 1% compared to the rest. And, and, and just, I want to quote one piece from Piketty's book, which actually summarizes it all. Because he says, there is absolutely no doubt that the increase in inequality in the United States contributed to the nation's financial instability. And the reason is simple. <coughs> one consequence of increasing inequality was the virtual stagnation of the purchasing power of the lower and middle classes of the United States which inevitably made it more likely that modest households would take on debt, especially since unscrupulous banks and financial intermediaries, freed from regulation and eager to earn good yields on the enormous savings injected into the system by the well-to-do, offered credit on increasingly generous terms. End result, boom. And, you know, that paragraph from that book summarizes the flaw of a completely divergent uh, economy and society. Just domestically, some threats that we need to highlight, and I won't go into them, is the regional disparity of whatever recovery is taking place. The truth is, uh, Dublin uh, is doing quite well in parts. Uh, and some of the urban centres, and you know, speaking in Donegal and I'm sure in lots of other parts of the country, uh, there's, it's very, very hard to see an economic recovery. And that divergence between different parts of this small island, I think, is a serious issue. Uh, another serious issue, and in fact it's reinforced by John's comments about the fact that interest rates may go up, is the absolute unacceptable burden that the Irish people had to take upon our shoulders in order to rescue not just the Irish banking system, but the European banking system. Less than 5 million Irish people have ended up paying 42% of saving the cost of the European banking system. Now, again, wouldn't it be great if we could just stamp our feet and get this solved? It's not going to be solved through a tantrum, but it is absolutely important that all Irish governments, whatever they're you, all our civil society, whether it's academics or employers' organizations and trade unionists, do not allow that to slip off the agenda because a fix there has to be. There might be more than one way to fix it. Uh, there may be issues about interest rates and whatever, but we need a solution to lighten that burden before the day comes when the interest rates on those debt burdens start accelerating and uh, we will lose control of our economy again. It's interesting uh, that in the last uh, while the Taoiseach's department initiated a consultative process to prepare a national risk assessment, uh, which is to be debated in the Dáil on an annual basis. And that's actually a very, very welcome development. Uh, the approach is quite comprehensive and addresses categories such as economics, environment, geopolitical, society, technological, and subtopics such as the ones already mentioned, the UK's relationship with the EU, the Scottish referendum, food safety, competitiveness. Interestingly, even though the document was prepared by the Taoiseach's department, the Competitiveness Council actually had to write to them reminding them that competitiveness wasn't just about wages. It was about things like education and training, entrepreneurship and the environment, 
uh, our environment, economic and technological infrastructure. Uh, and the pity is that the fact that the world is more complex than little sound bites actually had to be drawn to the attention of the authors of the risk assessment. Uh, the ICTU uh, made a serious uh, contribution uh, and input into the assessment. Uh, and in fact, we've, we've played on the pitch. We've said, for example, what we need to do is uh, uh, do all these kind of options that John spoke about, but uh, in particular the ones where two things happen at the same time. If you think about what happened in Japan recently where they had a tsunami and a nuclear meltdown. Uh, and, you know, we had the uh, property bubble bursts and at the same time uh, liquidity uh, uh, disappeared from the Irish system. And we need to look at, uh, you know, the what-ifs and we need to educate our people and we need actually a forum where this can be discussed. Uh, one of the disappointing things about the assessment is they see it being debated and the debate in the doll is people make statements once a year. Actually, an awful lot of the issues in the risk assessment affect society. They affect trade unions. You know, if we're talk, going to talk about wage bargaining or skills or training, they're going to affect employers. And there's no place for us to come together, apart from the McGill Summer School, where we can actually talk about some of those things. And that is a deficit in the social infrastructure that we have. The trade union input also said that we need to analyse some of the longer term changes that's happening in the world. The fact that we have an ageing population, the fact that we have more and more workers in precarious employment who are not going to be in, if I can call it, lifelong employment, that has enormous implications for the funding of our welfare system. Because our welfare system has that model. You know, it's kind of almost a Bismarckian one. You pay your social security contributions for a lifetime of work. If you happen to get sick or you happen to lose your job for a short period of time, you'll be covered, and then they'll pay your pension when you uh, come to retirement age. As more and more people are in precarious employment, that model, with that level of funding that we have in Ireland, is not tenable, and we need to have a grown-up discussion about it. Just the interesting thing, most people probably don't know, but we actually have the lowest social security contributions anywhere in Europe. And in particular, we have extremely low employer social security uh, contributions, but we're not allowed to talk about that. Another thing we're not allowed to talk about is industrial policy and uh, our taxation system. We all know from the Americans and the Europeans that the idea that Ireland can be what would be called by our opponents a tax haven <coughs> is not tenable in the long run. Uh, clearly, there is an amount of negotiation going on it. There's an amount of uh, overstating the case by people outside the country. But there is too much defensiveness and there is no discussion and debate taking place in this country about it. Uh, somebody joked recently to say <coughs> that uh, you know, we had as much reliance on our corporate tax system as we had with another economic measure in the 1820s and 30s called the potato. And eventually, you know, sometimes if you put all your eggs in one basket, something goes horribly wrong. And the idea that uh, the fundamental architecture of having an awful lot of companies in this country isn't that they pay 12.5% corporation tax, but they actually pay uh, 2 or 3% corporation tax, or in some cases not even paying corporation tax, is not a sensible, sane economic policy. Um, I'll conclude with, uh, again, touching on uh, one that uh, John made. I, I, I fear uh, that um, a big, big issue coming our way is uh, what's happening in the UK uh, and their debate about the EU. Um, as trade unionists, we meet our counterparts uh, from the UK regularly. The scary thing is I think Irish trade unionists spend more time thinking about the implications of the UK leaving the EU than the UK ones do. There is no thought through national debate. The debate is entirely skewed about straight bananas and all sorts of mad things. And there is no consideration around what the world would be like if they vote to leave the EU. And that's something that's going to have profound implications, not just for Ireland, but think about it as a border county. This has got incredible implications. The final thing I'll, I'll, I'll just say on, on, on this, and, and I very much welcome John's comments about talking about social cohesion. Because ultimately, unless the society has social cohesion, 
that there isn't an incredible disparity between the poorest and the wealthiest. That unless we have a system where education can be affordable, that health can be reliable, that pensions can be secure. In other words, the nuts and bolts of European social democracy. We will not be part of the European mainstream. And just think about it. Our currency now fits in the northern western European mainstream. Can we run the rest of society in an entirely different planet? The perspective of the trade unions is we cannot. That involves us having to have a discussion about social services, about why is the only discussion about the next budget being about tax cuts, as opposed to, you know, well, if we defer tax cuts for a year, what social services could we restore over the next 12 months? That debate isn't out there as we race to a single uniform single voice about what's going to happen. And that has never done the country any good. Thank you very much.